that group tonight, so uh, there could be plenty of interaction, I'm sure our uh, speakers won't mind that. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, my name is Peter Stilko, and I'm the University Librarian here at Hong Kong U. Uh, it's my great pleasure to moderate this session. Not that I think we need it, but uh, uh, such an intimate group, as I say. Um, but the book tonight is a quite fascinating one, and it's called Inside the World's Major East Asian Collections, One Belt, One Road, and Beyond. And it's uh, fundamentally a series of interviews with a very diverse range of people uh, who are curators of various collections uh, that the authors um, refer to as LAM, which are libraries, archives, and museums. And uh, if you put galleries in front of those, they become LAM. So that's the, the approach to the book. I mean, it's impressive in its, in its volume, size itself, but also in the coverage, and as I say, in the eclectic range of uh, LAMs that are covered here and the very interesting views of their curators. So with that very brief introduction, let me introduce two of the authors who are here. First of all is Patrick Lowe, Dr. Patrick Lowe. He is an associate professor at the Faculty of Library Information Media Science at the University of Tsukuba in Japan. And next to him we have his co-author, which is Dr. Dixon Chu. He's a lecturer in the Division of Information and Technology Studies in the Faculty of Education here at Hong Kong U. And the third speaker is Professor Ricardo Mack. He's not an author, but he will be sort of co-moderating, I guess, and ad-libbing on, on this uh, book talk. Uh, he's a professor within the Department of History and the Director of Advanced Institute for Contemporary China Studies at the Hong Kong Baptist University. So with that, I'm going to pass it over to one of the two authors to, to get us started. So, Dixon. Thank you, Peter. <laughs> so uh, it's a real honor to talk with uh, of you here in the library. Um, um, I'm teaching library and information management here for a few years and then um, um, I, start my, uh, I started my research in uh, library with uh, Patrick and then um, we do a lot of uh, um, uh, research on, on libraries and, uh, uh, as in Hong Kong and also in the East context. Uh, so this is uh, I think our first book uh, written together. Um, the, the aim of this book project is uh, based on a, direct, uh, on a series of uh, interviews um, um, with practicing librarians, archivists, and um, museum curators across the, the world. Um, um, for, for this first book, we, we want it to be a little bit uh, focused on the uh, Eastern Asian, East Asian collections in order to uh, have a better benefit to the local, uh, the local professional, so that uh, this also uh, serve as some kind of a teaching materials to our program, because our program have a number of stream nowadays, uh, not just library, but also uh, we have students from uh, libraries, archives, and so on, and yeah, also um, museums. So, uh, yeah, so. Um, um, we, we, we want to look at the, the good practice of uh, uh, these uh, professions across the world and also um, their changing roles, um, management uh, insights and, and so on. Uh, so how culture um, is uh, impacting various uh, countries and locations and so that the experience can also brought back to uh, the local context. Um, here East Asian refers not uh, just to the, the, the libraries of the people uh, referring to the uh, 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 of the East originated from, from East Asia but, but is talking about the uh, collections and uh, the uh, materials, arc, uh, artifacts and so on. Um, so that um, notably across the world, uh, these institutes are interested in keeping and uh, maintaining a huge collection of 
materials from or artifacts from the East Asia. Uh, um, these are these are num the number uh, number of the uh, institutes uh, covered in our uh, book. And um, um, be besides uh, 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 sharing the their their experience with 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 people uh, in the profession, we we also uh, all, we also have a vision that the uh, professions from libraries, archives, and museums have nowadays uh, more and more overlapping uh, functions and perspectives uh, that um, they sometimes have to uh, do the work of the other. Uh, sometimes, uh, uh, sometimes inside yeah. the museum there's a library. Yeah, yeah, inside, yeah. inside the library there's a museum. Yeah, 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 like yeah, here, yeah, yeah, there's yeah, inside the, yeah. there's a gallery. Yeah. So, yeah. So, so this kind of uh, uh, more in uh, we try to promote more interactions and knowledge exchange among these parties uh, in order to have a uh, you know more focused uh, uh, efforts in, in, in promoting culture and you know and many other uh, advantages if, if people work together to ex exchange knowledge. I, 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 I think we need to explain. We can have yeah, yeah. the uh, collaboration yeah. between the three parties with this, the future. Yeah, exactly. So, um, so um, um, as also, 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 we we hope the book uh, sort of ser serve as a career guide for the the student and graduates who are uh, interested in uh, this broad range of uh, culture related uh, uh, disciplines. Uh, in, uh, in order to uh, motivate them, okay, or give them some, you know, some insights on, 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 on what they can do and what is the current situation and so on, and how they con can contribute. For example, um, from, well, like as here, we have some examples. Say for a uh, U.S. university graduate who major in, say, uh, Asian languages. Uh, so what there are the career options okay, in, in addition to teaching the, the language. So for for us, say in a, a Chinese or Hong Kong uh, li library graduate, library science graduate uh, who wish to uh, seek employment outside uh, homeland. So what are the career opportunities and so on? Um, what are the unique skills that this uh, um, say uh, Asian Graduates uh, should acquire or process in order to contribute to the future uh, career. So, Ricardo, you have many um, history, history, history majors, right? So, are they are any of them interested in going in the uh, archive or archi archival science or, or museum studies yeah. uh, as as I a future would, career? I, I would say that not. I don't think there 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 are a lot of students who, uh, after completing their first degree in history, pursued a further career in uh, uh, public records management or uh, archives management, management etc. But I I really, I met some of them who are really crazy about this, and one of my <laughs> students, uh, she's a, a Chinese major, mm -hmm. a yeah. minor history, but after completing a number of courses in history, uh, she developed. A, great interest in archival studies now since in England pursuing a further right. uh, a second degree in this area but I would say that it is one among very few <laughs> yes I, I agree but, but on the contrary uh, when we look at our graduate there, there is a significant proportion of them coming from various uh, uh, history uh, or Chinese language or other cultural uh, management uh, uh, majors and, and uh, and come to us. Of course, they are not from just your university, but a large number of them, quite diverse. I, I yeah. would say that the, the yeah. people know yeah. the importance of sources, and, mm. uh, archives, and different kind of collection. They will make good use of them in the research. But to develop a career in this area is another matter. <laughs> right, 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 right. Um, we we try to cover a, a lot of the uh, um, areas as much as possible. Um, and um, we end up with uh, 
Thirty, thirty, thirty-six or something. I yeah, can't remember. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thirty-something chapters, and and uh, notably, uh, the the foreword of our book was uh, written by the uh, Archbishop of the uh, Catholic Church. He's the um, yeah. the uh, head of the um, Vatican Library and the Secret Archives. So, um, yeah, so this is, <laughs> <laughs> so I don't want to read it, you can read it yourself in here from the book uh, later, yeah, yeah. No, 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 he, he like it, he can put it in his So, um, we have, this is a, a list of the uh, um, um, chapters, which, which I, I don't go over because you can easily read uh, from the book or from the, from the web on the, uh, table of content. So um, that's quite a number of them. Um, then, um, can you say something? Like, uh, uh, having worked in the library field, uh, we have, I'm interested, like uh, Ricardo, as a as a historian, how would you, how, how when you go to the library, how do you use the collections, how do you use the archives? Um, uh, nowadays with the uh, internet, of yeah. course, uh, we can do a lot of groundwork before going to the library. But I remember in the good old days when I was still an undergraduate, uh, we need to look through different drawers, look at cards and categories, and to find out the books that, that we need. It was it was a very uh, interesting experience, but all these are gone for good, I would say. Yeah, but um, now, of course, uh, no matter what kind of sources that you want, you can simply look at the uh, internet and to find, uh, or through, we Google different things and find out uh, where these sources can be found in different right. archives and libraries. Now it's very handy and very convenient to get all these. Uh, of course, uh, thanks on one side to the archivists, librarians, and, and the company, on the other side to the uh, internet. Yeah, but, but what I'm interested in is that uh, when you, when you, after you have um, obtained the information or the original documents, how do you construct a narrative that would tell, actually reflect the certain period particular well, the period of history, a theme, or well, let's see, the, what was it called in Chinese? Um, si, uh, si kun, yeah. Okay. Um, this, this is something I try to point out in my PowerPoint presentation yeah. in, this, in, uh, in a minute, okay. Perhaps uh, yeah. I, I go through this and, uh, and give you a, a more detailed explanation. Yes, yeah, sure. Yeah, so, right so we quickly finish my part and then uh, I pass it to Ricardo. So our book uh, is uh, uh, going to be published by Elsevier, which is uh, uh, quite a famous uh, uh, academic, academic publisher uh, some, this summer. And then um, we have our other uh, book projects. One is uh, already published by uh, Patrick. You want to say something about that? Okay. Oh, that's right. <laughs> so uh, in a similar, similar style, uh, Patrick is in, interested in, in music, so he he interviewed the leading orchestra and op op opera librarians, and the next two books that we we, we jointly work together um, is uh, two ha two has been uh, arranged for publication. One is for the uh, leading national uh, public and monastery royal uh, uh, library directors. Um, Another is for uh, school librarianship, uh, interviewing uh, school school libraries worldwide. So we have uh, yet a four book in uh, uh, in our in our work in our agenda, uh, which we are now finding the uh, publishers is all about academic library directors. And yes, uh, I think I passed the okay. <laughs> so, uh, okay, just hand it over. Maybe while um, we're setting up the second presentation, I can jump in with a question. And um, you know, uh, you mentioned that you know you see the way of the future is that libraries, archives, and museums should work together. And and I think I think here at Hong Kong U we're a, we're a pretty good example of that. Exactly. We have the archives just here, and we work yeah. with them very closely, mm -hmm. and the museum as well. We collaborate on a number of things. The, the, uh, the archivists, we push reports to you. Right? 
Yes, correct. correct. <laughs> You're the boss. The, the, the museum director does not, but still we have a very, very good relationship in, yeah. in, uh, in sharing um, exhibitions, for example, or yes. exhibitions, mm -hmm. publications, talks. But in your, in, your, in your study, do you find any that were very exemplary in terms of the way that the three institutions came together? Maybe the British Museum or the British Library. So I, th yeah, maybe the British Museum or the British Library. So then, it's really interesting that uh, in the uh, the Hong Kong context or in the North American context, we um, there's an emphasis on all practicing librarians should have to be ALA accreditors, uh, MLIS, hope degree holders, right? But whereas uh, in the at the um, the British Library or at this uh, German National Libraries, yeah, and there would be higher uh, there would be higher historians or people who can actually um, have the abilities to handle pre-modern Chinese scripts, and they're hired as curators, not as librarians, and they would be having they and they would be hiring um, professional librarians to handle the actual circulation or the uh, collection management. Yeah. So there will be two streams. Yeah, and also yeah. inside, for example, the um, the State Library Berlin or the uh, British Library, there will be also curators putting up museums on a regular basis. So, But this, this system is really organic because it's very old, so mm -hmm. I can't really go into details, but yeah, it's gigantic. So then usually they would be having, a, for example, the, the British Library would be having a the chief li library, but she's not the head. So she's, on top of her, there would be another CEO. Yeah, yeah. So for the strategic planning, but she, this person, the, uh, the chief library would be responsible, meaning for the daily operations of services and stuff. Yeah. Okay. Is your, the situation here similar? Uh, no, quite <laughs> <laughs> So what did, how do you describe your daily, uh, typical day of work? Mine? Yeah. Uh, unpredictable. <laughs> <laughs> Varied. Um, you never know what is going to appear uh -huh. from day to day. Mm -hmm. But we have a very good structure in terms of, well, you know, I mentioned that we work well with other divisions, right. etc. But we have a very good um, layer of leadership across our functions and across our, our, uh, uh, our seven locations as well. So uh, one of the uh, issues like we really wanted to explore, especially for the other book, the, the uh, National and uh, Public Librarianship is the, what is, what is the definition of leadership in, within the world of librarianship? So how, can, you, can you talk about that? Oh, you're putting me on the spot. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's it's very hard to put a definition on it, um, uh, but I think I think the uh, there are certain characteristics that are important. Uh, I would say, and you know, one is the theme of, of your book, which is collaboration. I think uh, collaboration and leadership in collaboration. Is, the, is one of the major futures for libraries. And I think here in Hong Kong, the eight UGC libraries are really quite exemplary and, and the world does look at us. We have certain, um, well, we have certain advantages in terms of our geography, which makes collaboration work. Collaboration makes collaboration work uh, a little more easily. Um, so I think collaboration, the ability to collaborate and to work with others is important. Alongside that is, is communication. I mean, it's going to be hard to collaborate unless you can't, if you can't communicate. Obviously, you need a vision. If, you, if you're going to lead people somewhere, you need a vision. And they need to have an understanding of that vision. So uh, for me, those are, I guess, three of the key things. Um, but because it's the, 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 the area of librarianship is evolving so quickly, uh, you know, you mentioned the internet and you know, this concept.
mindset that everything is on the internet, which is quite rubbish, really. Uh, not true at all. Um, but just as an example, uh, because it's evolving so quickly, quickly, the ability to evolve and adjust and adapt you, not just you as a leader, but your staff as well. They're, for me, the four critical areas. Okay. So then I take over for a while. Yeah. Um, I'm very glad to be here yeah, because I make you this opportunity to show you why historians are so fascinated by the sources and why different kind of collections, archives, libraries are so important for our work. Um, I use a uh, Patrick spoke at Inside the World's Major East Asian Collections as the top title of my presentation, but I need to make it very clear that uh, th this is his book, not my book. <laughs> yeah. So this is our common image of history. Yeah. You find sources on one side, great collection of books on the other side. Yeah. And you are always impressed. Have anyone ever been to the uh, New National Library in Peking? Uh, it's a very nice place to visit, you will be amazed by the collection, by, by the building, the architectural features of the library. I was there several times, uh, once in the evening, when I look at the library and watching the sun setting, it was an amazing experience. But uh, history makes really great fun. But why sources are so crucial? I, uh, let, let us look at this chart on one side and see, on the other side see and see past events and the historical field. All these are gone for good, yeah, because historical events, what happened just one minute, one minute ago, is gone for good, and you can never see them again. But past events and historical field will leave behind historical evidence that means different kind of sources, written sources, artifacts, etc. And so the historian looking at these historical evidence can construct in their mind uh, the past event. Yeah, this is unseen because it is inside the mind, the head of, or heart of the historian. But historian, after constructing these images in his mind, will, putting, will put them down through historical communication. That means book, lecture, exhibition, exhi etc. And these can be seen. And finally, these historical communication can reach the public mind. That means the people, after attending lecture and exhibition, or after reading the books written by historians, got an image of what happened in the past. And finally, perhaps the public mind uh, transform what in their mind into historical action. That means after reading a book by uh, uh, a leftist historian, perhaps a person will become a and social activists, uh, then this is <laughs> historical actions. So I'm, I put historical evidence here because without this part, you see, the rest of the part cannot uh, proceed. Without source, how can we reconstruct the past and how can we create different kind of historical communication? And we, without all these, we cannot change the mind or impact, or impact on the public mind. So sources are crucial for historical studies and different kind of research. So another way to tell the same story, let's put it another way, the past gave rise to myths and sources. Here's myth does not necessarily mean the Chinese word sanwa. Myth is something, um, it's a mixture of truth, half truth, hearsays, etc. Fake news. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. This is all the this myth. Yeah. That's, for instance, uh, Ricardo Max is a good martial artist. This is a myth. <laughs> yeah, somebody believes so. Somebody uh, will tell you different things. So the past, as I said, is gone for good, but it gave rise to, to myths, different kind of hearsays. Um, a person, uh, uh, historian A say this, and another person say B, and another person say C, etc. And they, the past also left behind sources. So historian find and read sources. Then they challenge myths using authentic and reliable sources, reconstructing plus the past. This is how historians do the work. So the first thing we need to do is to find the source so as to challenge myth and to construct a 
more reliable uh, 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 narrative of the past. So after telling all this, uh, I hope that you, you, came to, uh, you come to realize how important sources are for historian. But there are different kinds of sources. On the one side, public records, let's say statistics, government reports, legislative documents, and court uh, records, transaction of an uh, association, any reports, etc. All these are public records. Uh, usually, you deal, you deal with these, yeah? yeah? And there are other written sources, let's say newspaper, articles, letters, novels, pamphlets, etc. These can be kept by individuals privately, yeah? and they can be also useful. And images, let's say photographs, poster, advertisement, these are the collection in public libraries, but they can be inside the uh, private collection of many individuals. And artifacts, let's say coins, maps, tours, etc. All these are sources, and historians make use of these to reconstruct the past. But different topics require different sources. Uh, for instance, if we want to study the eating habits in the Middle Ages in Europe, let's say, uh, then public records may not be useful at that time. There, there is, there, there are no uh, very uh, formal and systematic uh, public record systems, and that's why, we, if we want to research on similar topics, we need to make use of other kinds of sources. Let's say, uh, literary works, cookbooks in the medieval time, and of the final, uh, the cooking utensils, in, in let's say in the ninth or tenth centuries, all these can help us reconstruct the eating habits in that time. The BBC do very good yeah. documentaries on topics yeah, yeah. like that. Yeah, another, another topic, let's say history of prostitution in the Victorian age. How, how can we understand, how can we got an impression about the life of prostitutes at that time and how this trade uh, was made in the, in the, the late 19th century? So we, uh, other sources can be useful, let's say, police reports, yeah, of course, yeah. And the police on the one side, positive on the other side. We, we know that Victorian age is an age of uh, uh, tight, so they are repression, and tight social control. And that's why uh, uh, police reports can help. Court reports, yeah. After being caught, uh, the institute will be sent to the court, yeah. And the court reports uh, may tell about their life, about their uh, uh, the price, mm -hmm. <laughs> etc. And testimonies, a medical report. At that time, the prostitute could be caught and sent to a doctor for examination and inspection. And literary work, biographies, uh, some people like to uh, tell in their story about uh, their, 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 their deal with uh, prostitutes and letters between people. So these are sources, and these are the uh, materials by means of which historians reconstruct the past. And that's why public libraries, archivists, etc., are very important uh, people. Yeah, librarians and archivists are important people. They collect the sources. And sometimes you start with nothing, uh, but eventually now we have very systematic uh, uh, public management uh, office. So. Now, I, I turn to two new trends. The first one is history from below. What is history from below? Because in the past, only a very small group of educated elite or political elite yeah, have the right to write history. And that's why, in the past, uh, topics of historical studies uh, mainly focus on, the, let's say, war, diplomacy, political events, etc. And we call this uh, history from above. Uh, because only the top people have the right and have the opportunity to receive education and have the right to write history. But now, now education became very popular and many people receive higher education and at the same time more people are interested in their own stories. So they began to write their own story. We call this history from below. Uh, uh, using Wikipedia, okay, I make a very uh, a simple definition here. History from below is a type of historical narrative which attempts to account for historical events from the perspective of common people rather than leaders. Uh, 
there's an emphasis on uh, disenfranchised, the oppressed, the poor, the nonconformists, etc., all these marginal groups. So, and that's why if we go to the bookstore today, we find a lot of different stories, history books about, let's say, bandits, about thieves, about pirates, etc. All these are people, these people are, were simply overlooked in the past. Is, is, it why, is it what you got you started interested in the doing history on the local Kung Fu practitioners? Uh, this is another story. <laughs> <laughs> so here I refer to one very famous uh, uh, British historian, Eric Hobsbawm, uh, who was regarded as a leading leftist historian in his time. Uh, uh, he died uh, just five years ago. Look at the uh, major titles he has produced in, uh, during his time, uh, Bendis in the year 1969, Revolutionaries, Contemporary Essay in 1973, and Common People uh, in the year 1998. You see, these are what we call a history from below. And then other trend is a public history. Uh, I used to live in Taipo, but no longer now I live in Kowloon Tong as a warden of a undergraduate hall. I live in uh, my campus. So um, what is uh, public history, pop popular history? It is for the general public. And to be, it is critical of elitist, over-professionalized history, and it promotes politically self-conscious, community-based his history over to all and usable in political struggles. And it makes use of different forms to disseminate the research findings, let's say, through exhibition, drama, etc. And it creates a new awareness of the community and about the, uh, uh, the different groups. So this is another trend. And why I use this, these two trends to uh, illustrate my point, because if you look at these new, two new trends, you find that traditional, traditional sources may not help. Look at this one, it's about festivals in Taipo. If we really want to look into this um, uh, topic, what we need are, let's say, oral history. We need to interview people. Uh, we need to look at the local newspaper. That means not local newspaper does not mean Hong Kong newspaper. That means Thai old newspaper. Or we need to look at the uh, collection of, uh, of, uh, of uh, ordinary people. Yeah. So now I come to Patrick's book. There are three chapters that I want to refer to here uh, because all of them are about martial arts. And on the one side, they are history from below because they look at Kung Fu Master, about Kung Fu community. These are people uh, who were overlooked in the past. And in fact, they play a very important role in uh, uh, social growth uh, uh, from the past to the past present, yeah, because Kung Fu Martial arts is a fact, was a very important component of daily life in the past yeah, because the military people need to learn Kung Fu and some people, in order to earn their living, also need, also need to uh, learn Kung Fu to protect themselves. And on the other side, Kung Fu is interrelated to, let's say, festivals and uh, social life, etc. So these are things that we have overlooked for a long, long time. But now, a lot of people try to look into this uh, uh, important uh, but neglected uh, area. So, um, in Patrick's book, uh, in chapter 30, it's mentioned about the Hong Kong martial arts living archives. Um, and this project uh, was is conducted by a person that all of us know, uh, Mr. Jiu Se Heng and his group. And what what they have done so far, for instance, they try to collect technical data and represent these in different kinds of formats. So I, I uh, brought this book and I, I can show you a little bit later. I just um, uh, play with Dixon <laughs> on this book. Yeah, because they, they, uh, they really recreate, reconstruct the Kung Fu uh, history in a very uh, creative way. Uh, let's try a little bit later because there's a quote here. If you have a code reader and you scan it, then you, you can look at your phone and, and, and see how these Kung Fu master perform their uh, Kung Fu. And we can try it a little bit later. So on the one side, they collect different kind of data and to represent them through different formats. On the other side, they do a lot of oral interviews with Kung Fu masters. 
I think because uh, in the past, the Kung Fu master seldom uh, read, uh, 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 put down their experience in written form. So, oral history is a good way to try to recollect their experience and their uh, skills. And finally, documentation of the cultural phenomena, context related to martial arts, applications, or performance. Uh, the, uh, for instance, one project conducted by uh, Mr. Zhao was the Hakka Akeron, the Hakka Unicorn. Uh, now he's conducting a project in this area, and he commissioned some of my students to work for him on this. And the, fi the uh, final product will be uh, a long uh, report and at the same time, a lot of pictures uh, and great archives. So, I think uh, Patrick spoke in, in this session to point out uh, the, how a new topic can be developed through a collection of sources, archives, and other historians can also make use of this in the future. So, I think uh, for Kung Fu um, uh, 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 people, uh, this is something they may have done in the past. We bought such kind of books to practice ourselves. We believe that after reading this book, <laughs> after reading this book, we know how to uh, fight and we, not, and we can command the skills. And that's why in the past, there are such kind of books in the uh, publication market. But if you, uh, you can uh, ask, ask me for a, a copy of my PowerPoint. And now, if you look at it, you make use of YouTube, uh, you find that uh, all kind of uh, animation can be found in the internet. Uh, although you still cannot command the skill after reading the, after watching this YouTube, but this is another way to uh, preserve our heritage. So, and on ch uh, chapter thirty-one, uh, Patrick also point out another important thing about establishing a permanent kung fu museum in Hong Kong. And uh, look at this picture. I think uh, uh, Mr. Zhao already. Uh, complete this project and make use of uh, 3D uh, techniques uh, to, uh, to capture the movement of Kung Fu Master and how they make use of the strings and how they move and how they uh, uh, complete a performance. And, and this is another thing that uh, impressed me quite a lot. This is a good way to preserve and to collect important sources that we overlook in the past. And finally, Chapter 33, the legend continues, mentioned about the daughter of Bruce Lee and how she created a foundation that continued the process of uh, collecting uh, 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 Bruce Lee's uh, uh, artifacts, his uh, uh, personal belongings, and now it, she made use of these um, uh, uh, foundations to create libraries, archives, and some museum. In fact, I uh, personally, I'm not a big fan of Bruce Lee, but at the same time, I would say that he is really an icon of Hong Kong culture. And it's a pity that Hong Kong does not have an archive in a, a collection for him. So uh, uh, Patrick's book, chapter, chapter 33, also, also uh, thoroughlies on this uh, important uh, but overlooked uh, yeah. matter. Also, I want to add a point that only because of her that we are able to see Bruce Lee's exhibition at the Hong Kong Heritage Museum. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so because we asked her, you know, why, why, why he chose to uh, put this, um, donate all the uh, artifacts belonging to to your father, to the Hong Kong to a Hong Kong museum itself, by doing it at Los Angeles, which would guarantee you to make a lot of money. She said because my father was, you know, he was born and raised here. He made his name here, so he wants, you know, he wanted his father, you know, to contribute like his work to. Contribute con 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 back to the community where he was, uh, where he grew up and where he built his na name as a movie star. Okay, cool. then I stop here. I hope that my 15 minute uh, presentation can highlight the, the importance of source for uh, historical studies and for the general public. At the same time, highlighting uh, the chapters of Patrick's book. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, can I ask a question? Yeah. A, uh, the concept of history from below and public history, and if you think about, you know, you're talking about the internet previously, and if we talk about social media like Twitter, yeah. Facebook, and other 
formats, um, surely they must have a role in, yeah. in the preservation of uh, public history and history from below. So what do you think libraries and archives should be doing in terms of, of all of this incredible information that's out there? Oh, I, I would say that um, um, as a means to transmit knowledge and the and to uh, disseminate knowledge, uh, since these social medias are very important. In fact, every day I look at Facebook so as to find out uh, what kind of uh, news and articles that my friends share through this uh, mm -hmm. virtual reality. And, and I find that it's really useful. But at the same time, how to manage and how to collect sources from social media, I think it's not a question for me, it's a question for you. you, you mean, <laughs> But they write a lot of nonsense on Facebook. Yeah, of course, yeah. So they yeah. have to have a develop a, um, a filter yeah. to, to, to screen out the relevant information or the useful but then, information. But then again, what, what is nonsense today might be history tomorrow. <laughs> so screening is, is um, you know, needs to be done with a bit of caution. I guess I wasn't asking how to do it, but I was asking whether you, you felt that it was important. Yeah, I, I think it's the, important, yeah. yeah. Yeah, because now the... the the, the virtual reality, the, the cyber world is much bigger than our, our uh, uh, life experience. And that's why we reach out every day through the internet, through social media. We came to contact with other people at the same time. We share what we know. Yeah, we conduct conversation with, them, with, them, uh, with different people also on the internet. And that's why I think this is the major source of knowledge of our generation now. Uh, I, th I think nowadays a lot of uh, young people do not even read newspaper, newspaper. They only read the article shared by their friends. Mm -hmm. And right. that's why they create a reading community among themselves. Mm -hmm. This is a new way of uh, getting knowledge now. Yeah. But is that knowledge reliable? <laughs> oh, yeah. This is, of course, yeah. That, and that's why studying history is important because historians try to find out what kind of sources are, are, are authentic. And okay which kinds are more reliable, but historian can also be fooled. <laughs> so I see some young people in the audience. Are you guys training to become librarians or archivists or museum curators or histor history majors? Well, uh, we, we, we are the... Do you have questions or comments? Or you don't have to agree with what we say? Oh, so we are the master student here at Hong Kong U studying uh, library and information management. Yeah, uh, we we took Doctor Chiu's class. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. I, I'm a assistant librarian at one of the public libraries now. Yeah, so I I study part time. <laughs> yeah, he's a full time student here. So, so like my, my question for Ricardo, so as uh, we people work like well, from the library uh, side, if a historian, historian or history scholar comes to the library, how can we, we librarians better serve or we archivists better serve you scholars or do we have to be um, history, um, do we have to have a very sound knowledge in history in order to become a good um, Basically, I'm quite satisfied with the service provided by libraries in Hong Kong. In fact, it's very convenient compared with many, many countries. Yeah, um, uh, the convenience in what sense? Like, um, uh, just imagine if you go to uh, the library in Oxford University, most books, because their collections are huge, a huge, and every time you want to go, you need to place an order and wait for about four hours. <laughs> yeah, because uh, uh, one librarian told me that okay, you look at the library, it's so small, but the collection was underground and they extend beyond the city. <laughs> no. And that's why you you need to place an order and wait for four hours. It, this this is the minimum time that they need to bring you the book. Yeah, and. And for this reason, Hong Kong is small, but at the same time, everything was just a, everything is just around the corner. You want a book, it will be with you very soon. And in case your your own library does not have the book that you need, but through the Hong Kong all, the book which you in two or three days. I think few few, few countries, uh, according to my own knowledge, have, have similar service. 
Yeah, I studied in Germany a uh, long time ago, yeah, and then I still frequent and uh, major libraries in Germany. In case you want to order a book, oh, it could take you ages, <laughs> ages to get a book. <laughs> I think we have a question. Uh, just a point of information. Uh, first time I joined the reading club at uh, Welcome. Uh, well, I studied civil engineering for half, half a century ago here. I wonder where I got into the wrong room. Because when I enter, it says uh, one belt, one row, and uh, well, so, wow. Well, yeah, <laughs> that's our, our authors, um, the emphasis on that. And the he suggested that we just. No, because uh, we, um, you see, um, the list of libraries here actually. Uh, it covered all the countries all the way. We started the um, the interview journey from Vatican, and then we went to went through Italy, and went to England, and go th went through France and Belgium and Holland and Denmark, and and also went through Russia, and then we came we came back to Hong Kong, and then and also we uh, we also interviewed uh, people from Taiwan, Japan. So we yeah, said one bell, one and roll, and, and beyond. So, so yes. it's not that the theme that now the uh, Chinese leaders are talking about. <laughs> well, it, yeah, it, it could be it could be interpreted in many different <laughs> yeah, ways, right? Just, 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 I'm, we're talking about the geographical area, and also the culture, and the, also the culture background of the collection they made is uh, related. Because uh, they they they're not just collecting Chinese or Japanese uh, uh, artifacts, but uh, a wide range of uh, artifacts uh, in, in in this one belt and one row are collected by those those uh, libraries, uh, museums, uh, in, in large institutions. institutions. Yeah. What what were you hoping to hear from us? Uh, Talking about politics. No, uh, well, I'm a civil engineer. Yeah. No, I, I just I thought it's uh, inf inf more informative oh, yeah. on the, uh, the the one belt run road development now promoted by the Chinese leaders. Yeah, so that appears uh, this is um, uh, introduction introducing the library related to you know yeah. geographical yeah. geographical yeah. 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 okay. <laughs> I thought you were going to throw us oranges and fruits. <laughs> Any other questions or comments? Yes. So all the speakers uh, emphasize on the importance of archives. Uh, now Hong Kong has no archive office, I mean the government, and no archive legislation. So, is it, is it a, 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 a good phenomenon in Hong Kong or how to mitigate this? Yeah. Eventually, Hong Kong will become a no archive source to the whole world. No archive source? Wait, there, there are different kinds of archives, right? There are but no official, I mean, from the government. For yeah, instance, you're, you're talking about the government, the government archives. Yeah, yeah. also the, we, we also there's also the. For instance, archive. for instance, this year is the, uh, the, 50, 50th anniversary of the 1967, isn't it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So so there is a lot of activities recently about this, yeah. this history. Uh, many of them, uh, sort of complain that. We cannot find any expect ex, exclude uh, newspaper except newspaper. Mm -hmm. We can't find any official documents on uh, how Hong Kong government or the, even the British government deal with these events. Yeah. Where did they? This is this is one of the reasons. Like uh, my last book, I we, I interviewed um, Simon Chu, and one of my what we wanted to do is uh, through these talks we, is to create public interest, yeah. public awareness, so that we could, uh, you know, force the government maybe to change, you know, we are, we are what is it called, uh, are you hopeful? Uh, are you hopeful? <laughs> I, I, I am, personally, there's, yeah. there's so been a lot of, work together. yeah, a lot of activity from the uh, archives action group, yeah. and, and you, you, you would read about their activities and there's letters to the press and, and so on, but um, I think I think the public needs to get behind it yeah. <laughs> and um, to voice its concerns. Yeah. 
Um, but unfortunately, much has already been lost. So we're yeah. really just looking at, at, at a starting but point. When, when of the, one of the, the, uh, the, the challenges faced by the, uh, the archives action group is they, they tried really hard, but without the public support, you know, they, they can't really do much, right? Because they usually there is not tied in with the daily concerns of the uh, regular uh, the, uh, citizens, right? So they're more concerned about the achievement of the universal uh, retirement plans, you know, because <laughs> Only when major disaster disasters like uh, the Lama Island ferries and route, oh, where, where's the archives? No, how come there are no life jackets for children on board? Then they start to talk about to talk about it, but then they can't really push anything forward. That we need you guys to to help us to support us, right? So this is why we have been one of the aims of the, doing these talks is to create public awareness. And also um, in our uh, Masters of um, Library and Information Management degree, we had a concentration on archive studies. Although not a full degree, but at, yeah. at least uh, according to the need and um, of those people, um, they, 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 they did speak, speak to us uh, about, about, about this and, and we agree that there is a need, not just from the government, but we, we see uh, quite a lot of interest in in large organizations to 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 protect and pre preserve their heritage, um, that creates also a lot of uh, uh, job opportunities for this uh, uh, profession, and and that's that's not just for the for the good of the uh, in the public, but also for a lot of uh, real uh, practical uh, needs of the of the of, the, of uh, business organizations and so on. Yeah. The, the, the question to recount, why do you think um, local heritage or cultural identity is so important for a nation or for a community like Hong Kong? Oh. Why, why, why do we need to, why should we spend so much effort and, and resources on, you know, not, not even saying developing, but like to maintain, to, uh, to preserve what we have? Okay, um, um, let's focus on different nations first before going back to Hong Kong, yeah. because for uh, uh, some of you may come across the yeah, word the nation building, yeah, that means as, as a country, a nation after reaching a certain point, uh, need to uh, restructure itself to, uh, to, to, uh, uh, I, uh, to highlight its features and to create a, a, a nationwide authority. I would say that the nation building involves two sides, on one side is a soft side, that means the culture side. That means the people need to find out their common coherence, the common language that they speak, the symbolic meaning of particular uh, festivals, uh, uh, national symbol, etc. This is the culture side. On the other side, the political side. That means uh, to be a nation, you need to have a nationwide authority. That you have the uh, uh, ability. To, a nation have the ability to put through uh, to uh, uh, the, uh, policies uh, to protect themselves. These are the two sides of, uh, of new nation building. And if we put it this way, then culture will be a crucial element for the uh, survival of a nation. Because without the culture side, that means without the soft side, the country cannot uh, come together, cannot stay together for long. Just like look at Yugoslavia. It was put together by naked power after during the Cold War era. And the different, uh, people, different ethnic groups with different religions were simply put together by naked power. That after the naked power was gone, and the, the, the whole country fell apart. Then that's why we need such kind of culture side of, uh, of a nation. So where the Hong Kong, Hong Kong, of course, I would not say that, oh, I try to avoid this word. Yeah. <laughs> but we need, still need a community identity. That means Hong Kong people need to know where they are from, uh, how they further proceed, and what are the major values that they uh, treasure, and what are the uh, important heritage that is still alive in the daily life. I think these are the important uh, elements of our culture and our society, and these are to be preserved. And archives, records, are important elements for such kind of reconstruction. Yeah, I would 
was talking to one of the, the two uh, faculty, one of these uh, old uh, Kung Fu teachers. We, 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 when we started the book talk, we were just you know, jokingly saying, oh, culture is so hard, so impossible to sell money, mm -hmm. but it's so priceless. Yeah. <laughs> we, we just laugh, but we, we felt just uh, what we do is important, but it's, at the same time, it's because it's so hard to sell money, so it's hard to get support from the uh, um, government uh, to give us any resources to so that we can continue what we do. You know, sometimes even to squeeze a place in the local bookstore to to give us a place to, to speak about what we do is, is could be very challenging. That's why we always have to team up with you. <laughs> but community community spirit or identity is something that we cannot fully explain. I just tell you one story about uh, I and my son. I used to live in Taipo, as I say, and, and Taipo has its own soccer team, yeah, Wolf Taipo. Uh, I remember it was formed when uh, my son Anthony was about uh, five or six years old, and we and Ta Wolf Taipo has their own uh, uh, football field. And one day we uh, in one afternoon, Saturday afternoon, we walked together to that field to watch a football game, play. Uh, by Wofu Daibu versus another stronger team. And then we walk to that place and watch the game. And finally, uh, oh, I think at, on, at the very beginning, um, uh, um, things does, uh, did not look good for Wofu Daibu, but eventually, in the last minute, Wofu Daibu uh, won that game. And, up, and after leaving the, uh, the, the, uh, the football field, and my son told me silently, that. I nearly wanted to cry. So after that, we explored Tai Po, and we uh, walked to different places uh, uh, during our leisure time, and we de developed a very special uh, feeling with Tai Po. And after, I will say that after finishing my wardenship, I will return to Tai Po to live there until I die. <laughs> so community, community spirits are something like this. Uh, so sense of belonging is very important. Yeah, yeah. So well, what about to you, Peter? Like as, as an Australian working in Hong Kong, how do you describe <laughs> this? Well, what what exactly is Hong Kong culture? So uh, when I, I was talking to Ethan Tan, the director of the Hong Kong Art Museum, she was the Hong Kong culture is really flat. It's always uh, how do you say to um, negotiate between the two two discourses. It's not exactly Chinese, but it's not exactly Western. But but and then it doesn't have to serve any uh, political agenda, but at the same time, is when you look at this, this Hong Kong, this done by Hong Kong artists, it's not by, by, by Japanese, not done by uh, Taiwanese artists. I mean, it's, it's, for me, it's hard to define, but I can, I say it's, it can be defined by its uniqueness. Or uh, practicality. Well, of Contrast. course, there are all those elements and the cliches and yeah. what have you, but, but it's when, when all of those things come together that makes you so unique, I think, that makes Hong Kong such a unique place and its culture so unique. Well, is there, is there a culture or they just uh, put anything, uh, they put a price tag on everything? And anything no, I, that cannot be sold uh, for, for money is not important. Well, I, I think the, the language is a very defining element of, of the culture. And it's, I mean, not that I speak it uh, very well, but my understanding is that it, it, is, um, it is such it is a unique... Right, right, and, and, and very, very fluid and floral <laughs> in its uh, delivery and uh, interpretation. So I think, I think language is a very... What about the working style of people in Hong Kong? I'd rather not comment. You <laughs> <laughs> can say something. Not at like this point. Eh? It's very hard working, obviously. It's uh -huh. been my, my impression for 15 years. But, but let's let's talk about lambs, okay? <laughs> or do we we have any more questions or comments? Any, uh, any 
many people, and any like your students, like they could soon, uh, they would be soon to. You post them some questions. Soon to be parents. <laughs> Do you have any aspirations? Uh, because um, China is the originator of the Bell and Row, and since you used the name Bell and Row in your first book, yeah. so <laughs> is there any plan to have a Chinese edition of this book? Depending if we could find someone who is who is, is a good translator, or yeah, I I Dixon could do very good translation work, but we we would rather work on a new book than spending our energy on translating. It's so, ask someone to, to yeah, rewrite yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. To rewrite yeah. it is a better choice than yeah. translation. Yeah. But Ch China, China, you know, if you like, if are you saying that we should aim like aim aim to get our book to be sold in China. In, in. No, I think to replicate the, the same approach to Chinese libraries. Right? Uh, okay. Libraries yeah. China. Yeah. But uh, we we try to. Oh, you mean like to approach the li uh, libraries in mainland China and ask them to be. Yeah, we tried that, but it was really difficult. Usually, the librarians don't want to talk. You know, they. But I'm strongly encouraged to the Beijing Library. Yeah. Yeah. I I was strongly encouraged you to yeah. to yeah. produce a Chinese version. Yeah. Yeah, because it benefits the general public, as I said, public history. Yeah. 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 Usually, the, 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 the first question, before you even send them a list of interview questions, do I get paid <laughs> <laughs> for doing this interview? <laughs> yeah, I get that question, uh, that question a lot, you know, do I get paid for doing this interview? You know? mm -hmm. Well, it's very difficult, even they have done the interview, there is like ask them, asking them to sign some any kind of agreement form because it's the uh, normal pub, pub, uh, publishing uh, uh, procedure, but they still don't. Okay, anything else? Yeah, yeah. Okay. okay, so with that, I'm going to um, wrap this up and to thank each of our three speakers Dixon Chu, Patrick Lowe, and Ricardo Mack. Oh, thank, thank you. you. Thank so, you. thank you. And we have a small gift for them. Speaking of uh, history, this is um, a replica of the Hong Kong Almanac from 1846. Uh, it doesn't make for great reading, but it's a, an interesting artifact nonetheless. So, thanks to all of you. And before you go, if, if, if you would like to complete the survey, uh, we just ask you a, a few small questions. Uh, we will have another book talk in um, June, June the 7th, and its book title is Qing Cash, and the title of the talk is Rise and Fall of the Qing Dynasty, Seen Through Its Coinage. So hopefully we'll see some of you then. So thank you for coming. Yes, no, not here, but by Dr. Werner Berger from Munich University. Mm. Okay, so thank you. Thank you.